Um, I'm just going to introduce our moderator, and then he's going to handle the introductions for the rest of the panel members today. So welcome. Please help me welcome uh, Drew Tatusco is going to be our moderator. He's the Assistant Director for World Campus Professional Development. And please help me in welcoming the rest of the panel. Thanks, uh, Steph. Um, if I do this with my legs, it's because I feel like I'm in a big boy chair. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I feel really special. Um, so today, we are talking about student motivation or lack thereof. Uh, and what I kind of want to do is have a conversation with the folks up here, starting with introductions. Who are you? Um, <laughs> it's not as existential as it sounds. Um, Sam, why, why don't we start with you? And we'll just work our way down that way. OK, so I am Sam Richards, and I teach uh, race and ethnic relations here at Penn State. I've been here for a long time, over two decades. So I teach a big 750 student class. Right, I'm David Stone. I'm director of collaborative programs in the office of the vice president for the Commonwealth campuses. And I've been at Penn State for, I think this is five months. I've moved in the middle of winter. so. Glad to be here, and, and part of what I'm doing is working with the campuses on developing uh, shared programs and a course consortium model. And so many of you uh, at the campuses I've been uh, talking to and will be working with on how to uh, get the campuses to work together on these programs and, and move forward. I'm Paula Bigatel, and I'm an instructional designer with uh, World Campus uh, Faculty Development Unit. I work with closely with Drew on a lot of the OL. Um, courses that we've developed for faculty, professional development, and uh, glad to be here. <laughs> you keep that this one. This is ours. <laughs> All right, so hi, my name's Christina. I am an undergraduate senior. Um, I'm majoring in psychology. I've been at Penn State for the entirety of my undergraduate career, so the past four years. Um, I'm the director of the Honors College Orientation, and I'm also developing a leadership class with Honors College right now. Hi, I'm Sarah Fisher, and I'm a doctoral student in the College of Education here at Penn State. And um, I was an elementary teacher before coming back to school, and I completed my master's degree in children's literature through the World Campus while I was teaching. Thanks. Um, so just a little bit of my personal like interest in this topic. Um, comes with a very recent experience with an online student. So, so I'm teaching a class, right? And I keep getting these papers back with the word um, uh, peppered throughout these papers, F-A-L-L-O-W. Does everybody know what fallow means? Yeah. Right? It's like fruitful. <laughs> um, so, but it was in sentences like, uh, like rules that she fallowed. Right, over and over and over again. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so that's that's a that's a word that that people will type and spell check won't pick it up. So I mark it on the paper on the first one, every single instance where it was wrong. Great. I get another paper back, same issue, over and over and over again, minus minus minus. I couldn't, no matter what I did, I could not get the student to work with me to learn how to write. And it was frustrating because she had no motivation to improve. So I want my, something that I try to tell my students is, why can't you improve with me? Because this is a team effort, you know? Teachers get frustrated when students don't improve. So I wasn't sure what to do at that point, and I've hit that issue in many, many points. So hopefully, we'll come up with all the answers today, and we'll all be able to take this information back and solve all the problems in higher education. <laughs> you have no big task. Uh, Paula, I wanted to start with you with a, uh, <laughs> whoa, really? <laughs> Seriously? Um, it's because you picked the middle seat. Uh, from what I understand, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to motivate a student to be successful in a course. However, what are some guidelines that you've seen in the literature, um, two or three because there are obviously many, um, a few guidelines that might be instructive for how we can help students stay or be motivated in a course? Well, my 
um, reading about motivation and learning theories and whatever, I've learned a lot and tried to apply some of them, but it really de depends on the audience that I've worked with. And for example, let's look at the adult learner, who is my particular audience, is the adult learner. And I know that what particularly motivates them, and this conforms to what I read in the literature, and that is, you know, they tend to be more goal-directed, more goal-oriented. They come in uh, having a lot of experience that they want to share with, with others. Um, they want to have a little more control over the learning experience because they're used to that in life. Um, they certainly want respect, and that's across the board. Um, they, they, they want to be able to um, not only con control things but have choice. So for the most part, you know, that conforms pretty much, you know, to our conventional knowledge, you know, and uh, common sense approach to teaching adults. And I've used those strategies with a lot of success. I mean, I tr do try to bring out the adult learner and show them that what they have to say has value. And to me, that that is so important to make them understand that, hey, uh, what I have to share with you that's connected to this um, new learning experience is of value. Um, some adult learners, especially if they've been away from the, the, the learning experience for a while, you know, come in with maybe um, they don't have that lack of confidence. So they don't have the confidence to, to actually, well, whatever I have to share isn't going to be particularly meaningful. Um, and I think I, we have to bridge that gap and be very inclusive. So some of the things that I've seen and how important it is for student engagement. I mean, that just is <coughs> something that we have to all think about how we're going to have entry points with all of our students and get them engaged in the learning process. As we've already known and seen in, in the Josh's uh, uh, presentation, and that is how important that activity, interactivity, and engagement in the content and maybe with others, however you try to um, make sure that that knowledge is, is committed to memory and long term term memory, that that's really important. But the thing is, what I've also seen is, okay, let's, let's look at um, um, the, the need for control. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Control, for example. You think that, oh, well, you know, adults all want control. Well, sometimes, given the context, you know, given that they've got all these obligations and, and, and time commitments and whatever, they may not want to have all the choice and control you know, that, that you think, you know, conventional wisdom dictates. So I've found that, you know, you got to know who your learners are and kind of investigate their goals for the course, their expectations for the course, because you cannot be giving them what they expect, and that can be a huge demotivator. So what I've found in, you know, that this may be something that, that sounds good in paper and in literature and, and in the research, I've, I've found through experience that there are some that, you know what, they don't have a whole lot of time, so just kind of keep it simple. You know, don't give them a huge amount of choice because oh, that'll just confuse them. So I'm, I'm very mindful, you know, of, yes, there, there are probably places where you can give them choice, but then you've also got to include strategies where, um, all right, if you don't have um, an idea of what you want to do for this project, you know, or this presentation, or whatever is involved in the course um, uh, activities, uh, I would, you know, help them with, okay, let's limit the choices or I'll give you something that you can work on that maybe matches what is within your, your life experience. And that might even go back to what was said earlier about cognitive load. Absolutely. You know, if we can make choices more finite, maybe yes. that will improve the learning um, within that situation while giving a certain amount of freedom. Yes. Right? Yep. yep. Um, so I want to turn to Sam. <laughs> um, so I saw a new study from um, Faculty Focus that came out yesterday, with, uh, and they surveyed over 1,500 faculty. And it, it noted first that 75% of faculty surveyed have integrated technology in some degree into their courses. The second part was interesting, though. The second part said that over 60% indicated that their teaching was more difficult than it was five years ago. The primary reasons were unmated, unmotivated students and underprepared students. So. With your experience with, with students, how does that compare with the survey results? Um, how difficult is your job? How honest do you want to be? <laughs> 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 I, 
Well, look, if I'm a bit of an iconoclast here because I, I don't follow the, the kind of path that most people follow, I think, many faculty members. So my job's really easy, actually. And all I have to do is be excited by learning and be excited by teaching. I don't worry about learning styles and teaching styles and all that kind of stuff because while I think it's really important and I love hearing about it and uh, has certain value, it's just not my approach. And so I, I can only do follow my own approach and my approach is to be excited. And I'm, I had an experience as an undergraduate student when one day I woke up just magic happened. I don't know what it was. <clears throat> Might have been the drugs, but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take them that day, so I was something of a. And uh, but I woke up, and so that's I spend my entire life w with that as a goal to just get people to be excited. And learning is exciting. It's amazing. It's oh my god. And so I think what happens is a lot of students are sitting, they're sort of lost in here in their phones or they're lost in different places because what's going on in front of them is really not very exciting. And that's true for me. If, it's not, if, it's not, if I'm not being turned on by what's in front of me, I'm going to get lost in my phone because I can find something exciting on my phone. So I want students to have their phones out. I mean, I want a back channel going on. I want, and look, if I can't keep your interest up here, like whatever we're doing, whether it's activities or whatever, if I can't keep your interest, go into your phone and get lost somewhere. You know, go chat with your friends about what you're going to do tonight. That's fine for me because that just ups the challenge. Now, I just have to be more exciting than the conversation you're going to have with your friends, which means I got to really work at it, which means I have to be excited about what I'm doing. So that's my focus. So. I'm, I think that not a lot of people kind of walk into a classroom like that, but uh, but I, that's the way I take it. So, so it's a skill to be really exciting then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's actually very difficult, right? Because yeah. school, by and large, is prison. I mean, the two go, the two are sort of hand in hand. It starts in kindergarten. They start ringing bells, and you follow. It's like Pavlov's dogs. And so you, you, they ring a bell and you take a nap. They ring a bell and you have a snack. They ring a bell and you gather around the piano and you sing, I mean, whatever it is, right? And so we learn, we learn to shut up and, and not think. And so now school's really pretty terrible. I mean, it's a terrible place to be. So it, in, a, in a way, then the, my job, it, it's difficult to break that. So I just have to you know, just be excited. So with that said, <laughs> let's go to our students. Um, Sarah, you completed a degree online. Can you identify um, a memory of an experience where you felt an instructor was present online, and how might that have helped you be more engaged in the class? I, I realized after I made my introduction that I forgot to also say that I have the unique opportunity because I've also had a chance to instruct some of the courses I took online as a student. So to get to sort of try out the things that my instructors did for me in my online teaching has been um, really helpful, not just teaching online, but teaching in my classroom as well. Um, the thing that comes to mind most for me is that um, Throughout the children's literature courses, I should say that they're pretty small courses, under 20 people in each of our online classes. But the instructors have designed the, the text in such a way that um, they're always there when they're not there. So I'm a literature person, and I'm always thinking narratively. So um, the narrative voice that they've sort of threaded throughout, you might call it scaffolding, but throughout all of the courses and throughout all of the text within the courses um, always made them feel present. So it was this sort of disembodied instructor that was always there, that always had the same, you know, informal, welcoming, inviting tone, if that makes sense. Um, but on top of that, which was one of the things that really made the online classroom a place for me, um, was when instructors would um, one, per, one instructor in particular would remember comments she had made 
on my work or feedback or conversations we had had and would refer to them later in the course and say, remember, she was always tying back to things we had talked about. Um, even if they were online discussions that she hadn't specifically commented on things that I had said, she would refer to them you know, out of nowhere at times. And it really made me feel like, wow, even when I don't see her comments there, I know that she's reading these, I know that she's um, synthesizing and thinking about the things that we've talked about because she would bring them up later, maybe in my paper feedback or in later discussions. So that was, that was a really big thing for me. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I don't know, does it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out, does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> This isn't class either. <laughs> um, so, Christina, first, as a, as a psych major, have you had any classes with Professor Weed? Yes, I have. I actually took research methods with him. Okay, great. So anything you say will not be about him. <laughs> I just want to make that clear, you know, keep, keep you on the good side of the faculty. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, just making sure... Um, Okay, so we have all been, had what can be called bad classes, right? Um, classes that we wish we never signed up for and that were a complete waste of time. None of yours, Sam. Um, <laughs> at least they, somebody said that up there. It was a nice comment. You gotta look at the back channel, it's cool. Um, so especially during registration time, there are conversations that go through about the bad professor to avoid the good person. Oh, you gotta take a course with this, this person. Avoid this professor altogether. Um, can you recall a situation, this is kind of flipping it around a little bit, a situation um, in a class where you felt completely demotivated and it was like the energy was totally sucked out of you, um, where you, you went into the class with um, a good set of expectations, you were excited about it, even before midterms, you wondered, am I still here? Why? <laughs> Are you still talking? Um, so what, what are some of the, the problems that you might have been able to detect during that? So um, in the fall of this past year, I decided to take LER 136, which is race and employment, um, especially with a special focus on women. And I was really excited to take that because I'm a psychology major with a minor in sexuality and gender studies. Um, and especially being an Asian American woman, I like to learn about those things and those issues. So. It was an online class and I was really excited for it because it was going to be something that I could do a little bit more flexible, um, with more flexibility, cause since I'm a pretty busy student who's involved in a lot of things. And I was really excited and in the beginning, you know, as with all online courses, you do your little course introduction, you say hi to everyone even though you can't see their faces. Um, and I did all of that and I tried to talk to my professor and I had asked him after looking at the syllabus about some questions I had about assignments and like how things were going to be run and he would just kind of respond to me and say well I it's all in the syllabus I don't understand why you don't get it and that was really frustrating <laughs> for me because I'm like okay well your syllabus is not clear enough can you please explain that to me um, and he, it still kept going on like that and I wasn't the only student who was like that even on the online form that we had for our help group for the course um, students would be asking the same question that I was and he would just say I don't understand why you don't know it. Um, so that was really frustrating for me because I was really excited about the class. So the first few weeks of the class, I went through the assignments, you know, because it's, you go at your own pace for the most part without the help of the instructor. So I went through it and about a month into the class, I got an email from a person that I had never talked to before saying, hi, I'm, new, I'm your new instructor. Your old instructor has been replaced. Um, <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, at that point, it was a month into the class, so it was too late to really drop it without it showing up on my transcript. And I was like, it's a 100-level uh, class, you know, it shouldn't be that hard, I'll keep taking it. Um, so I d kept taking it, and we had all the assignments there that hadn't been touched because our own instructor just did not do anything, which is probably why he was replaced. <laughs> um, but even with our new instructor, I was hoping to get more out of the class. And even then, when I would ask her about things, she would she would answer us and respond to us. But even then, she would grade us on the assignments that we had done, even though we hadn't been given the foundation of what we were expected to do and whatnot. Um, so that was frustrating, because I didn't do as well in the class that I would have liked. But at the same time, it wasn't because I 
didn't want to do anything. I had made the efforts to do things, and I wasn't met halfway there. Um, and to have an instructor replace a month into the semester, out of a semester, you know, a semester is only four months. That was really frustrating for me. And at by the end of the by midterms, um, I didn't do the readings anymore. I just did my discussion posts based on what I could pull out of my head. Um, <laughs> um, and it was it was frustrating because I didn't learn that much from the class because I didn't feel like I was being met halfway because people were saying, well are going to grade you on things that we'd never really established and to have an instructor that was replaced it was frustrating. So it, it sounds like, like there was a, not only a lack of clarity but a lack of respect that mm -hmm. might have been taking place there. Um, where I think in your situation I would feel a little invalidated as, as an adult, <laughs> you know, as <laughs> a student um, trying to take a course if, if I'm being dismissed, dismissed like that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, would, would your estimation, Sam, kind of sound like that, that, that this was sort of a lack of respect between teacher and student? Yeah, although I would tend to not say respect, I certainly would say a lack of, uh, of an under, understanding what the roles are, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, really. It's hard as a student, you know, students, we, students actually often walk into a classroom as I did as a student, assuming that the person who's in charge of that room actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> Never assuming that maybe they got thrown in there at the last minute, as I did when I taught my first class. I literally, the guy said, okay, you're hired. I said, all right, well, let me go home and I'll kind of look at some of the material. He said, nah, you don't have time. Class starts in 10 minutes. It's down the hall. <laughs> and the class was called Cybernetics and Human Ecology. I had no idea what cybernetics <laughs> was. <laughs> I said, can you tell me what cybernetics is before I start? And he said, nah, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so I walked in the room and I asked the students, what's cybernetics? And they said, I don't know. I said, well, we'll figure it out before the end of the semester. I mean, this is what happens sometimes, right? And we assume that that's not going to be the case. So, yeah. David, you had a comment and then I'll ask you a question. Yeah, and um, you know, when we, it's interesting when we think about our students in classes, they have been in school for several hours a day, K through 12, for many years. They have been, become familiar with the process instruction, they're experts in that whole experience and how that happens currently. Um, I think that one of the things that I think students expect to see is, um, I, think, I think they appreciate understanding what you're trying to do in instruction and how you're trying to do it. I think being a little more transparent in your process, you know, use a syllabus as a way of describing what you're trying to do and, and help give them some of that context. And I think students would value having an understanding of what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. And so. I think that's useful to engage them and make some of those processes that we don't necessarily make explicit part of the process of learning. Uh, and and it, it brings to mind, d don't put that down, I have a question for you. Just make sure I don't breathe <laughs> <in>. <laughs> All right. Um, it, it brings to mind um, some, and may, maybe some will say, well, that research is, is lousy, like, you know, learning styles. <laughs> but um, but the, the, uh, some of the literature about expert and novice, okay, and, and how different cognitive pathways are, are developed. That if I'm an expert in something, A, I was obviously motivated to go that far, you know, to get a, uh, an advanced degree in it. Most students, and, and I've told faculty this before, most students who take your undergraduate classes don't care mm -hmm. about what you're teaching. I'm sorry. It's just the truth. I've not cared about a lot of classes that, that I've had at the undergraduate level. The second part of that is you've dedicated so much of your life to this, you do things on an automatic level, in an intuitive level that most of us can't even conceive of, much less a student. Um, so it's hard to expect them to match where you are and pull them up to that level without paying attention to all the stages in between. That can be horribly demotivating if, um, if I'm expected to snap into your cognitive framework within a semester. And, you know, one of the courses I've taught before is a, a management of information systems course for non-IT, non-computer science majors in the past. So we have people who are construction management, you know, of arts types of programs. And so as I taught that course, I tried to, there was a p major paper in the course, and so I tried to pull in their discipline and provided some, um, uh, you know, ongoing discussion about their topic, made the program, the actual activity something that went longer. Um, with you know literature review components and other pieces and try to really work with them individually. It was really a lot of work, but 
at the end of the day, I, the students started to connect more with that when it was framed within their, their area of interest and, and things. And it's not possible to do that for all classes, and it's, it's intensive um, uh, to work with the students that way. But yeah, trying to make that bridge, especially in courses where something is completely out of their, what they went to college for, it's, it's, it's very important. So um, just taking one step back um, before we go back in, um, what, what are some broader implications for the issue with the, the really the, the teacher-learner relationship and how engaged students are in the classroom situation? Are there institutional um, impacts that can come from that, especially if it breaks down? Yeah, I think, you know, um, one of the things, w you know, that I think for students, th th when they arrive on our campuses, um, physically or virtually, um, they have, you know, made the commitment to be part of that university community. They have an expectation of being part of um, an experience that's, um, and, and they have selected your institution uh, to be part of that. I think that often um, some of the things the students encounter initially are, uh, you know, gateway courses, challenge courses, the kind of kind of designed to weed out students, hopefully not, but often that happens. Um, and so I think often students uh, come and they're not really uh, sure if they're ready for the university level uh, courses. And so I think that some students who may be first time college students may not, first generation college students may not have the support networks that we have in place um, when families where they a long history of going to college. Um, where they have other friends who are going to college. And so I think that it's really important to help kind of intentionally build that kind of learning community and um, making sure the students are socially part of a, a broader community um, that can help them across multiple courses. Um, and so not only make sure that students are engaged in the, the actual uh, individual activities of the courses, but we need to think about as you were talking earlier about the narrative process within a course, I think we need to have a narrative process for the university experience. Um, and it gets more challenging when you have um, a large institution or multiple campuses and things. But I think that um, providing some sort of framework, some sort of context for the student as, as they're thinking about the university experience and how these individual courses make up a th this total goal that they're trying to work towards, which is the, the degree and their next, next stages in their career or academic study. Uh, so I think that if this, that breaks down, if students don't feel connected, they don't feel welcome, they don't feel like they have an ability to be uh, effective in the courses, if they don't feel like they're being supported by the university with resources when they struggle, I think that is starts to impact things like retention, progression, and then the overall university experience. And so we have things at universities where we have first-year uh, first experiences and things to help kind of bring students into that, that um, uh, community but I don't think we necessarily think about them at the program level and the academic programs we have. Uh, we have a lot of courses that may have really great experiences and great design and through them, but I think we need to really think about how do we build the program narrative and how we actually engage the students and provide that bigger picture and opportunities to participate in extracurricular activities in terms of you know, competition teams, uh, different clubs and other things that kind of give, give them those opportunities to connect with other people and, and, and develop that kind of competency in their, in their field of study. Um, thanks. And this is, this is, I'm just going to throw this out um, for anybody who wants to answer it because it's, it's a question that I just thought of. You were bringing up student engagement and attachment to the institution um, and, and attachment to different social groups happens through different mechanisms. So what about faculty attachment to the institution? How does that impact how engaged the student might feel? Sam, you mentioned about being excited about a topic. What if I'm not excited about where I'm working. Does that affect how excited I am to teach? Um, or, or how does that bleed through to the student experience? If at all, I'm just putting it out there. If anybody wants to pick that up. No, that was not well, in the script. <laughs> <laughs> I just think if you're not happy in your job, you know, and you're not happy in your environment, well, that, of course, is going to bleed through you know, to, to the students and be communicated to the students. You know, I felt like you've got to work with your faculty to, f to make them feel supported, you know, in what they're doing. And I think, you know, on rural campus, because my experience has been, recent experience has been in rural campus, if you're working with faculty, you know, in an online environment and, and they've got um, uh, technical support, they've got people that really can be there when they need someone uh, on the technical side because some faculty don't feel comfortable, and then you've got instructional designers that can work with, okay, how are you going to present your, your, your content? Um, 
so that the cognitive load isn't there, you know, that, 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 that it's manageable for the students and what have you. So all of these things are going are, are gonna to help benefit the student. And I think we're always reminding faculty that, well, we think of students first. And sometimes they can forget about that in that process of, oh, well, you know, it's what I got to teach. Well, it's also what the students have to learn. And so there's a different orientation there, too. But if they're not happy and there are struggles there, how can that not, <laughs> you know, affect? And, you know, if you're part of the university community, you're working with other faculty, you have students that may have an interest in a particular area, you may be able to refer them to other faculty, other courses, and kind of help them make those connections that they may not be able to find themselves. Um, you may have a student that's very promising as maybe a potential researcher. You may be able to find research opportunities for the student. Um, so I think that, yeah, the best case, I think, as you're engaged, if the faculty are engaged in the programs, they think about and they're aware of what else is happening out there, they can really help make those help the students make those connections to where they, where they could be and, and, and broaden their, their opportunities. Um, I want to go back to our, our students over here now. Um, Sarah, you, you have experience teaching in the elementary school environment. Um, what were some of, ex of your experiences there, some of the strategies that you might have learned to keep kids motivated um, that maybe you, you think would be applicable to the university environment to help students stay motivated here? Well, um, it's kind of interesting because I'm extremely introverted. I would consider myself really introverted. So um, I really had to learn my strengths walking into an elementary classroom because I'm not very outgoing and lively, as this seems like Sam might be in his <laughs> classes. <laughs> so it was a struggle for me at first as a teacher to try to engage. Um, I taught third and fourth grade to engage um, the younger ones. And so I would just try to throw a kink in things every now and then um, and do something unexpected. And so something that comes to mind is reading the Chronicles of Narnia. When they come in one day, I don't have to make a big production, but they have to enter class through a cardboard wardrobe. So things like that that are completely unexpected but sort of motivating to them. Um, are things that I would do in my elementary classroom, and then they'd be excited the rest of the day, no matter what we were doing. But thinking about how I can do that in the classes I'm teaching online, and um, how we can all do that as a, a community, um, I was sort of thinking about how that wardrobe in my classroom is a representation of how I experienced the novel. So. Um, C.S. Lewis writing is really dry, especially for fourth graders in 2014. And so for them, for me to be able to show them how I experience it and how I'm sort of envisioning and, and um, engaging with the text is, is getting them hooked. As Sam was saying, it's me showing my excitement in a way that's comfortable for me. So in the online environment, um, I feel like my instructors have done that exact thing by sort of representing the material in a way that is really um, characteristic of themselves, in a way that really represents how they experience and understand and engage with the material. So I'm, I'm not, I can't think of any specific examples of how that would look like, but just, I know Julie, Julie's back there, hi. Julie's our instructional designer, and she's really awesome about putting our own personal touch on things, and so, you know, somebody else wrote the courses I'm teaching, but how can I allow the, the students to walk into the course and see it through my eyes? And then I could scaffold them into seeing it their own way. So I don't know if that makes sense, but. No, I, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> at one presentation yesterday, uh, somebody mentioned if, if there was going to be a drinking game with this, um, this would be a great. So today's, I think, scaffolding is the buzzword. <laughs> um, but, but that means that, that it's, it's an, it's, I think it's an important concept that keeps coming out, that some sort of structure um, that's clear is important so that a student knows what the expectations are, and second, that the instructor actually does that. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I don't know if, um, Christina, if your experience has been that um, some faculty will start with a clear set of expectations, but then things get kind of derailed. Um, have you ever had one of those experiences? Yeah, I actually had that experience last semester with my class I took. Um, so I took 
BBH448U. So that's an honors epidemiology class I decided to take as an elective, which I know is a little unusual um, for a psychology major, but I took it because I wanted to learn more about epidemiology. Um, and this time the syllabus was clear and upfront um, as compared to the semester before. And it, it was just interesting because everything was so clear cut in the beginning and I thought it would have been a great class, especially since there was a lot of doctoral students um, helping us with the class and the professor who was teaching it was really renowned for her research, um, which I have found over my undergraduate years does not always mean that they are a great teacher. Um, but it just, over the course of time, like deadlines that we would have that she had set forth in the beginning, we would be meeting them as deadlines and then she would completely forget about them um, and say, oh, I didn't know you had homework due today. I guess I'm supposed to grade that later on. Um, and after so many times of that, it just, you know, things just fall apart because I lost my motiv motivation for learning about epidemiology. Um, and I've had great class experiences. Um, just, just a disclaimer, because I'm talking about the ones that I haven't had such a great time with. Um, I've had great class experiences. It's just like I've also had my fair share of bad ones um, where professors have fallen through with what they've done, and especially when I'm trying so hard to do better in the class and they aren't, they aren't meeting their own deadlines to do things or aware of the own deadlines that they set forth for us. Um, so so it, it, let me uh, bounce off of that. You know, one of the problems and the problem that I'm hearing coming out of what you're saying is that learning is, is uh, to such a degree based around grades. And the syllabus is really more a set of rules to follow to get the grade that one wants to get. And so, you know, when you said, well, I, you know, the, the professor didn't really come through with their part of the bargain and I lost my motivation to learn. Well, that's because we link motivation to learn and, and, and to engage with, with rules and directives that are on a syllabus, right, which are ultimately rooted in grades. I mean, not, you know, because that's just what it is. And I think, wow, you know, that's, it, that's true. I see that. I see it with my students. And it's very unfortunate because motivation to learn really in the ideal world has nothing to do with following rules and grades and all that kind of stuff. It should be, you know, in an ideal world, if, this, if the professor doesn't come through with something, well, that should have no impact on your motivation to learn, right? Because motivation is, should be so deep that it's, it's irrelevant. But it does, right? And this is kind of what we're stuck in. So, I mean, I certainly have learned over the years that to, if I walk in one day and say something like, oh, 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 we have a quiz next Tuesday? Oh, I forgot. That, the class will just turn around and say, oh, this guy's, you know, not, uh, you know, he's not organized or whatever. And I think, oh, my God. You know, so uh, the one thing, I can be completely unorganized, but what I've learned is to make sure that I follow the syllabus and don't ever change even one tiny thing, which is why it's 10 pages long, right? So uh, <laughs> tiny, you know, 10-point uh, font. And... Uh, and so this is unfortunate. This is where we've gotten, right? So I just kind of battle through that as much as I can. But. I want to, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. I was just going to jump in and say um, that I think it's important to remember how social learning is. And that's something we always talk about with the pre-service teachers in elementary ed. But for all of us, <clears throat> learning is a social activity. And one thing I should have said earlier that I didn't is that some of my instructors have kept us motivated um, just by encouraging us to engage with other classmates outside of the course, even if it's outside of the space of World Campus or our Angel site or whatever it is, to you know, ask somebody to be your friend on Facebook and talk with them when they're a space apart from the instructor that feels so more social than academic. Um, I love that you know, in a lot of our courses, there's group work online. Um, but it's still not the same as, you know, getting to know people outside of class. So even in the online environment, I think that's a really big motivator for people and to keep them engaged and also um, to have someone to hold you accountable. Yeah, and I'll just jump in as well. In the um, online, you, you make me um, remember my days in the College of Education and uh, pre-service teachers. I used to place them on their... Uh, assignments at the school districts in the in the area back in 1997 so it's going back quite a bit and um, 
what, what, what I find interesting is, you know, like I've, I've got several different perspectives, and that is, you know, like I, I started out working with students, helping uh, student teacher su supervisors, you know, with their um, in integrating technology and, and what have you. Um, then, then I was the student. I went back and got my PhD here too. So then I was the student, and I was the in the face-to-face -face class, and then I was in the online class, and then I taught a face-to-face -face class, you know, like while I was finishing my my um, dissertation. So then I got that student experience, and then it's all in instructional design. So then my first job is doing instructional design and working with faculty again, and now I'm teaching. So it's like. It's, it's really come full circle. But a lot of what you're saying is, you know, like I, I agree with Sam about the enthusiasm and, you know, showing that, you know, like I really like what I'm doing. You know, like I love the content I'm working with and I, I, I love the social aspect and getting students, the group work that was so important and I really like having students work together in groups, get to know each other. And, you know, so there are a lot of things that we can do to get our, our, our um, students really excited about things. And I remember in an online class, and I've mentioned this to Drew and I've mentioned this to a couple of other people, you know, that keeping that connection that David talked about, you know, like the, having the community, making the students feel like you're in a community of learners and that we are all connected. I had a student tell me, you know, somewhere along the line he forgot he was taking an online class. And I thought, that is amazing to me, that if I can make them forget that there's that distance, you know, that's the, the power of presence. You know, that's, that's all uh, about that, that presence that we have with our students. So it's, it's like that connection that we have. And it isn't just always about the content. You know, it isn't always about the pedagogy, but it's about, you know, a lot of other things. It bleeds over to their personal lives and bringing in, you know, other things that, that show that, hey, I respect, you know, like who you are and what you do even outside of class. And then it isn't always about the grade because that, that's the thing that I'm trying to overlook. It's like, don't tell me exactly what I have to do. You know, like there, there have been times when students will say, well, they don't love, they're afraid to make a misstep. You know, like give me all the details and the instructions step by step. I have to know because I'm afraid of getting it wrong. And I'm going, you know, why not be really creative, go outside the box and give me something that, you know, I'm totally surprised at, and maybe I'm going to change the assignment, you know, for other, for others down the road. So why, why not do that? You know, like I'm, I'm excited about maybe how they can get excited about being involved in the task instead of looking towards the grade and getting everything right down to the, you know, nuts and bolts. So. You know, Christina, I'm, I apologize because it's been two like horrible examples that you've given. <laughs> <before>. <laughs> Clearly, you said that there there have been great ones. So, um, what what is one of those uh, good examples of, of a class that worked well for you and, and that kept your attention and involvement the, the during the uh, during the term of it? All right. So, for a better example, um, and kind of bouncing off what I think has been kind of a theme. Um, about the issue with student motivation and especially with grades and as we saw earlier today how our transcript is kind of like a Walmart receipt and like grades and like learning has kind of been commodified for you know we take this class we do the assignments give me my A um, to show it up on their transcript and like the classes that I've taken that have been the ones that I've learned the most from have been the ones that I haven't received a grade other than the one that I got on my tra transcript um, just because the professors or the teachers were willing to learn with us throughout the entire semester. Um, and just to balance back to a bad example, just to contrast, so I've taken two women's studies courses. Um, so one was black and white sexuality, and then the other one was intro to LGBTQ. And black and white sexuality was the first class that I ever felt like I had anxiety walking into class. Um, and the reason for that was because the expectations of our teacher were just so high in that you need to learn 50 pages of feminist theory every single class period, and she would never slow down just to help us process the information versus my other class um, was the intro to LGBTQ, where it's like, okay, I understand that the class is not at this pace yet. Let me stop and learn this with you or help you understand and process this. Um, so I'm rambling a little bit, but just the classes where 
I'm actually allowed to take the time to learn um, if I'm making the effort and showing that I'm making the effort to learn. Because it's frustrating, as I've mentioned multiple times, that if I'm not being given the resources that I need to learn, um, then what do I do as a student? So. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and this is where I think sometimes, sorry to jump in here real fast, but this, this is where I think sometimes the learning design team, those of you who are involved in learning design, um, could, could kind of come at this from a different perspective because we always have the resources to learn, right? They're always there, but sometimes we get so busy doing, or so occupied doing the busy work and that we don't have time to just sit back and take in that maybe a simple idea that, that could really transform our lives. And so the information is always there, but it's just when we're busy spinning on the hamster wheel, um, you know, like enlightenment comes with a simple recognition of a simple thought, you know? And so it, it, you, don't get in, you don't come to enlightenment by <clears throat> reading some 900-page religious text or something. You know, it's a simple, it's like a be here now statement. So I think that's what teaching is, that's what learning is, that's the excitement of it. And so we get caught up with the, the hamster wheel stuff. So the learning design people, I, I heard that this morning, somebody said, I, I, I'm not sure it was, uh, who it was, but oh my gosh, yeah, give, give space to breathe. You know, to I think if you talk about you know, the busy work, the small tasks, the activities and courses, I think, I think students will do those things if, they, if there's some context of what that will build up to in the future. I think setting the stage, giving them a, a big picture perspective of what, what you're gonna learn in the course and then how the different things you're doing are part of that. I think, again, making the, the, the process transparent to the students, I think helps, it helped me in, in, in the courses I've taken over the years, but uh, I don't know if that's something the students have, can talk about. We have about five minutes left, so final thought. Um, <clears throat> one minute each, I'm gonna time it now. Um, start, starting with Sam and working over, what's your final thought if you, if you were to leave one, one nugget of advice to, uh, to faculty or learning designers on how to help students stay juiced and engaged in a course, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> students have the last word here. Yeah, no. I, I know, you're thinking of five things right I now, aren't you? I, it, <laughs> no, I, you know, honestly, no, my mind's sort of empty. I'll, get to, I'll follow what I just said, <laughs> I, empty mind, empty you know, mind. in a way. Give us the space to... To, to even you know to discover excitement um, in, in a person and 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 drop the negativity you know stu every human being is a vessel desiring to grow and to learn and it might be shut down but you know then it suddenly opens up I didn't come alive till I was 20 years old I spent my whole childhood from age 12 on just smoking weed and drinking beer you know and then one day I just woke up and, it, and and I don't think it had anything to do with any of the, those things and it took me a long time and so I'm still learning you know it's all just it's excitement it's, it's just human life life wants to grow life wants to expand all this negative can I say bullshit <laughs> that we bring into this world of education and then we want to blame students and turn the mirror back on ourselves you know how many of us are just going home every night and turning on the television and and getting lost and so on because you know what because we we've, we've lost hope that life is really amazing and cool and that's how our students are they're just dying to be turned on and they don't all get it some some think I'm a complete jerk off and that's great good for them because they need to see me as a jerk off and others think I'm like some sort of walking on water like g wonderful that's fine too or maybe not but <laughs> but it's all that, and I think that would be my, that's like, the, I guess that's my little mini rant. Just like, no, this is all an opportunity. You don't know who that student is, or that person is that's going to just turn on in that one thing that you say, and just like, oh my God, there it is, the light bulbs go off. We never know that. And even the students that seem to be the most disengaged, the most out of it, the most obnoxiously just anti-everything that could be, that, that supposedly we stand for, they might be the, the most intense person. They might be disengaged because they've had just such a terrible experience of people bringing ne negativity into the educational experience. So anyway, that's my final thought. Okay, <coughs> be hopeful. David. <laughs> well, you know, the theme of the conference is think, plan, make. 
right? And, um, and so when we think about that, I think, uh, you know, if we have students who are not motivated in our courses, they're not, they're not doing well, I think we need to think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, plan to do something different and then make it happen, and this needs to be an iterative process. I mean, we are, people who are in instructional design are process focused, um, it's a continuous process, we're gonna be doing improvements. So I think as we teach courses, as we design courses, we need to look at what's, ha what's happening, see what's going on, plan what we're gonna do differently, and then make changes, and then learn what's gonna happen. You know, and, and I think if, the more, uh, more we are engaged in our own courses that we're developing, the more we are thinking about the students and where, th where they're coming into the picture, um, what their experiences are, and what's worked in the past to motivate them. The more we can just think about those things intentionally and then plan that as part of what we do and just do it, I think that'll, that'll get us very far. So. Ah, there's a lot that's uh, been said and, and you know I keep going back to you know, some of the things that I've been reading in the literature and, and on motivation and whatever, but basically, you know, it all comes down to, you know, I care about individual students. And I think the caring, the flexibility that you have, you know, the, the need to find out what your student needs are. Because you, the, the, the student that does maybe come across negatively can be your best teacher. And I really feel like you can learn from that student what you could do to improve. And I always want to know what that feedback is from students because I want to improve and gee, guess what? Maybe that's going to inspire them, you know, to do the same because that's all part of the learning process. You know, like forget about the grades and following A, B, C, D and, you know, all the steps and, you know, whatever you have, have to do. Have a love of learning. You know, this is exciting stuff, and I want to inspire that in, in students. And I want them to know that, you know, I'm there for them to, to uh, support them in what they need to achieve and be successful as well. Um, you know, I didn't kick in into my academic co career until college. I was a terrible high school student. Um, and I'll bet you any of my student, um, uh, my teachers would have thought, boy, this is the kid that's going to be the less likely to succeed. But you know what? It takes something to get, uh, you know, a student turned on, and you just don't know what it is. Should I use one oh, or three? <laughs> 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 um, I guess just to sort of reiterate, um, students want to be respected, um, and also just kind of understand what's going on or why they're doing the things that they're doing, and that we're not just doing busy work, but whatever we're doing, it's for the betterment of our learning process and just for us to be better people and better learners. Last word. Um, I guess I just want to repeat what was said over here, just that sometimes we don't recognize motivation in our students um, and we don't recognize engagement. Those look so differently to different people and if we have an expectation of how students show engagement, then sometimes we'll miss how they are engaged in ways we can sort of lead them further. So I would just say to, if we practice an ethic of care maybe and show our students that we really um, want them to succeed, that, that, you know, maybe we can find those access points. Awesome, thanks everybody for uh, the discussion up here today. And I think our conversation will continue after this. So that's where you can ask all your questions. Thanks. Thank you.